Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Presonetic Cell International A Level, Biology Unit 4 for January 2022. This is the part 1 video. I'll do the part 2 and put the link below the description box. Let's begin with question 1. Question 1 says, the photograph shows a polar bear. So polar bears are adapted to live in the Arctic Circle. Polar bears have a layer of fat beneath their skin. This fat insulates them from the cold and can be used to supply the polar bear with water, which is metabolic water. They say they have a thick fur coat, which also insulates them from the cold. Polar bears feed on seals, or the polar bear sits on the ice and waits for a seal to come to the surface of the water to breathe. Question essays, which row of the table describes the type of adaptation of polar bears? Among the adaptations they say, they say they have thick fur, so this is anatomical, they have thick fur. Behavior, we can see here hunting by sitting on ice. And physiological, they produce metabolic water, so D is a suitable answer, as we can see here. So moving on, they say, what is the niche of a polar bear? Niche is a role of an organism. Since it feeds on seals, its niche is that it controls the population size of seals, so the answer should be a C. The next question says, suggest why the polar bear needs to rely on the store of fat to provide it with water. So I said, because there is lack of fresh water, because the water is mostly salty, so it has to rely on metabolic water for fresh water. The next part says, climate change is resulting in habitat fragmentation, and this habitat fragmentation causes groups of polar bears to become separated from one another. They want you to explain the effect that habitat fragmentation could have on the genetic diversity of polar bears. If there is habitat fragmentation, there will be a lot of inbreeding because the separated polar bears will be breeding with themselves and not with the other groups. So there'll be a lot of inbreeding and that is going to cause a decrease in genetic diversity. So I say genetic diversity decreases fragmentation or the separation causes increase in inbreeding and this will decrease the gene flow. This brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two, thylakoid membranes contain chloroplast pigments and molecules of ATP synthase. These membranes are the sites of the light dependent reactions. This is the graph shows the absorption spectrum of two chloroplast pigments from one plant. So here we can see the percentage of light absorption and the wavelength of light on the horizontal axis. So they've given us the graph for chlorophyll A as well as that of chlorophyll B here. So the question down here says, draw the action spectrum for this plant on the axis below. Now, when we look at this one here, remember action spectrum is going to be showing the rate of photosynthesis as wavelength, wavelength varies. So we can see there is an increase and we see a peak here at about 425 nanometers, which is about there. And then at about 460 nanometers for this one here, for that of our chlorophyll B, this peak here. And then we have to show that peak there at that, and then the other peak there at that, because they are the most outstanding peaks. So I drew that, that, then this part is a little bit flat, but it should not touch the x-axis. And then it continued like that, and finally like that. The key thing here is this part should be higher than that, and it should never touch the x-axis because nothing touched the x-axis here. So I put some things here in red. I say the peak at about 425, 460, 640, and 670. And then you should draw the contours uh, to show, of course, the absorption spectrum. They should be in line as uh, the, the contours we've seen above. And they should not touch the x-axis. So if you had done it like this, everything will be okay. So here they say calculate how many times greater the percentage of light absorbed uh, by chlorophyll B is than that absorbed by chlorophyll A at their maximum absorptions. So we're going to go back to the graph for both. So we can see that for chlorophyll A, the maximum absorption is this part, which is about 69%. And for chlorophyll B, we see the maximum absorption is about 85%. So we are going to divide 85 by 69 in order to know how many times more it has or how many times more it's greater. So 85 divided by 69, we get 1.23. So it is 1.23 times greater than chlorophyll A. So the answer is that. The next part says thylakoid membranes contain different types of chlorophyll pigment. Explain the advantage of these for a plant. If a plant has many pigments, it means they can absorb light within a variable amount of wavelength. That means there is going to be maximum absorption of light and therefore there can be maximum photosynthesis. So I said 
The different chlorophyll pigments can absorb light of different wavelengths. This is going to maximize the absorption or, or maximize the absorbed light. And this ensures that more light is absorbed for maximum photosynthesis to take place. The part here says the ATP synthase molecules are proteins. Which row of the table describes the bonds that form between amino acids in a protein? So I use this as a demonstration. We have one amino acid and we have the next amino acid. So the two amino acids are going to come together and there is going to be a peptide bond formed as this water molecule is lost. So this carbon is going to be attached to that nitrogen and that is going to be a peptide bond. So the bond should be a peptide bond. And the amino, uh, here they say the part of the amino acid that the bond forms between. Uh, so here it's going to form between the carboxyl, uh, the carboxyl group, as well as the amino group. So the answer here should be A, which is suitable. Let us continue. Here they say products of the light dependent reactions are used to synthesize amino acids. They want to describe how plants synthesize amino acids. It means from the light independent reactions, we're going to have GALB. And from GALB, a nitrogen atom has to be added in order for it to be converted into an amino acid. So I say GALB from the light independent reactions is converted into amino acids because the nitrates taken up from the soil are used to provide the nitrogen atom, which is required to make the amino acids. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question three, human immunodeficiency virus infects human cells, causing symptoms that may result in death. They want you to explain why the virus is an immunodeficiency virus. Immunodeficiency is basically lacking an immune system. So meaning in this case, this virus is going to affect the immune system. However, we also know that HIV virus infects T helper cells. So I say it weakens the immune system by destroying T helper cells because they are going to be infected and they'll be destroyed, decreasing in number. So uh, the B cells and the T killer cells cannot be activated. And again, remember, the T helper cells carry a job of uh, activating the B cells as well as the T killer cells to perform their functions. Now we know once the B cells are activated, they become plasma cells that are going to produce antibodies and antibodies carry out opsonization, agglutination, while the T killer cells are going to kill the infected cell or cause the death of the infected cells. So I say, so the B cells and the T killer cells cannot be activated and consequently antibodies cannot be produced so there'll be less opsonization and agglutination and also fewer infected host cells will be destroyed. That is for the purpose of the T killer cells. The next part says a number of antiretroviral drugs are given to patients with HIV. These include reverse transcriptase inhibitors and integrase inhibitors. They want you to explain how these two drugs reduce the involvement of HIV. Now this is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It means it's going to inhibit the action of reverse transcriptase enzyme. Remember, reverse transcriptase enzyme acts by causing the conversion of viral RNA into DNA. Then also here we see integrase inhibitor. Integrase is an enzyme that helps to incorporate viral DNA into the host cell DNA. So if this is inhibited, it means the integrase cannot be able to function and therefore that viral DNA cannot be incorporated into the host cell DNA. So I say reverse transcriptase inhibitor prevents reverse transcriptase which is the enzyme, from making viral DNA out of viral RNA. And also, integrase inhibitor prevents integrase from incorporating the viral DNA into the host cell DNA. So that is it. Let's continue. Here they say these two drugs are given in combination with other antiretroviral drugs. They want you to suggest why patients are given combinations of drugs. Now remember, these drugs are cutting off different sections of the HIV infection mechanism. Some of them are preventing reverse transcription. Others are preventing uh, the integration of the viral DNA into the host cell DNA. Others are going to be preventing the virus from uh, attaching onto the host cell. So, so many steps have to be blocked. So we give so many drugs so that the so many steps of the HIV infection can be prevented in order for the drugs to be effective. So I said using various drugs increases the chance of the drug being effective. Uh, because some drugs just prevent viral entry into the cell, but they cannot prevent replication. So also some drugs may enter some cells, but not others. So due to this, you want to make sure the drug is very effective or the combination of drugs you're using is very effective. So you use as many as possible to stop or prevent as many steps along the viral replication chain as possible in order to have maximum protection. 
So here they say if a patient stops taking the antiretroviral drugs, the number of virus particles increases again. Suggest why this increase occurred. Now, taking antiretroviral drugs does not completely remove the virus from the body because, of course, the viral DNA is going to be there or the viral RNA is going to be there. So, once treatment is stopped, the steps through which the viral replication was blocked cannot be blocked anymore, and that means there is a chance that the, vi the provirus can be used to replicate and therefore create new viral particles. So I said, treatment with antiretroviral drugs does not completely remove the virus from the body. When somebody stops treatment, viral replication can occur, and the new virus particles can burst out of the host T cells to infect others. So the particles are going to increase. Remember, this question is concerned with the increase in the number of the viral particles. So they will increase again because they're bursting out of the host cell and therefore they'll be infecting other cells as well. So there'll be more viral particles in the body. This brings us to the end of question three. Let us continue to question four. Question four, pathogens continuously adapt to invade their host cell. Host cells continuously adapt to avoid infection by pathogens. This is an example of an evolutionary race. The diagram shows the pathogen lambda phage attached to its host cell E. coli. So here we can see there is this is the phage. It has a gel protein. This gel protein is going to be used to bind onto the surface of the E. coli in order for the viral DNA to be inserted into the E. coli. We can see there are multiple rings. These are proteins found on the surface of the bacteria, and these are the sites where the gel protein is going to bind. So here they ask how many of the following statements are correct for lambda phage. Number one, the genetic material is DNA. That is correct. The capsid structure is described as complex. Yes, that is true for lambda phage. And the genetic material codes for the gel protein. That is also correct. So three of these are correct. Therefore, the correct answer here should be a D. Moving on. Here they say describe the role of the lambda phage gel protein. Remember, this is a protein. Let me take you back. It is a protein that the virus uses to attach onto surface of E. coli in order to infect. So I say it here. It attaches to the multiporin of the E. coli so that the genetic material can enter the bacterial cell. DNA in the lambda phage is going to enter into the bacterial cell as the G protein attaches onto the multiporin on the surface of the E. coli. Next year they say multiporin is coded for by that gene of E. coli. They say multiporin is involved in the transport of some sugars into E. coli. Give one reason why sugars are important to E. coli. Sugars are important because they're going to be used for respiration. So respiration occurs and ATP is going to be produced. That is going to be the energy source that E. coli can use. So that is important for respiration. Here they say discuss how E. coli and lambda phage could interact and develop in their evolution race for existence. They want you to use all the information in this question to support your answer. So in my answer, I talked about how E. coli is going to evolve and how the lambda phage is going to evolve. So in the first step, I talked about E. coli evolving so that the phage cannot infect it. Then I talked about how the phage not being able to infect the E. coli, it is also going to change itself in order to be able to infect the E. coli. So first I said, if a mutation occurs in the, the gene, remember this is a gene that codes for the multiporin, which is the protein on the surface of the E. coli. So they say the structure of the multiporin will be changed so that your protein on the virus can no longer be able to bind. Now, it's very important you talk about, uh, let me use a different color. It's very important when we talk about the structure changing, that structure should remain functional. Let me write it here. Remain functional, meaning it should be able to absorb the sugars. If I take you back here, just a minute. Here they said multiporin is involved in the transport of some sugars into E. coli. So it should remain functional, meaning it should still be able to transport the sugars into the E. coli. Otherwise, if it changes too much or if a mutation occurs and changes it too much, then it will not be able to allow the virus to bind. However, it will also not be able to allow the protein, the sugars to be transported into the E. coli and then ATP cannot be produced because respiration will not be able to be carried out. So let's go on. I said also a mutation could also occur leading to the production of an enzyme that cuts the gel protein from the multiporin. This is if it's trying to bind, it could be cut off. So these two factors can prevent E. coli from being infected. The E. coli not being infected, therefore, will survive. Remember, it has a mutation, which is a, an advantage, so it will survive. 
and it will go through cell division, creating new bacterial clones. Now, each of these clones will have the resistance to infection, and therefore, it will be able to survive as well. So, the presence of the virus on the surface or around the bacteria could have acted as selection pressure. Now, when I went to the site of the virus, I say the virus needs to be able to bind on the bacteria in order for it to produce new viral particles. However, if it cannot, then a mutation could occur in the viral genetic material coding for the gel protein. Remember, this gel protein on the surface of the virus is what it uses to bind onto the, uh, the protein on the surface of the E. coli. So here we expect the structure of the gel protein to be altered to enable it to bind either onto the multiporin or onto another uh, surface or another molecule found on the surface of the E. coli. So ability to bind to the multiporin is selection pressure. And therefore, those that can bind more strongly are able to enter the bacterial cell, producing new viral particles with their, because they will have that genetic advantage. So this point here I put here is in connection to what I said already. I said the mutation could also result in ability to bind to another site on the bacterial cell. So I'm talking about the mutation in the gel protein, which is found on the surface of the virus. It could allow the virus to be able to bind onto another molecule on the surface of the E. coli, which is not the multipor multiporin, and therefore it can be able to infect it in another way. So this brings us to the end of question four, as well as the end to the first part. Thank you for being with us. Please do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.